Hi, welcome back everyone. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for the whole event, our last speaker today, Joyce Huang. Joyce Huang is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in Architecture at the University of Buffalo and founder of Ants of the Prairie. She is a recipient of the Exhibit Columbus University Research Design Fellowship 2022-21, the Architectural League Emerging Voices Award 2014, a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship 2013, a New York State Council on the Arts Independent Project Grant 2013 and 2008, and a McDowell Fellowship 2016 and 2011. Her work has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, Mat Matadero Madrid, Venice Architectural Biennale, and Rotterdam International Architecture Biennale. Wang is on the steering committee for U.S. Architects Declare and serves as a core organization for Dark Matter University and on the editorial board of the Journal of Architectural Education. Wang has practiced professionally in New York, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Barcelona. Please welcome Joyce Wang. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can you, can you all hear me? Is this? OK, awesome. Um, well, it's a real um, pleasure to be here with you all and a real honor. I, I just have to say I've been super energized and inspired by all of the talks and really great to be in conversation with everybody and to see old friends and to meet new ones. Um, and really, congratulations to the students on such an incredible feat organizing this. So I'm really just super happy to be here. Um, so the title of my talk is Design for the Collective, and I'll start off just by kind of framing what I mean by collective. As architects, I think we oftentimes, um, uh, of course, understand our relationship to clients, um, those who commission our work. We understand um, our relationship to users, so maybe those who are um, using our work but don't ne aren't necessarily, not necessarily our clients. But outside of these circles, there is a kind of third group that I think oftentimes we don't take into consideration. Um, when we are um, thinking about buildings and the built environment, oftentimes we'll see um, animals not necessarily as part of that environment. We'll see them as pests. And um, in the artifacts that we design for animals oftentimes show this kind of conflicted perception that we might have toward them. So on the one hand, on the left, a kind of birdhouse shows the kind of, you know, um, how we might kind of feel t toward uh, having birds in our, in our parks and our backyards. Um, but on the right, you, of course, you see the kind of bird spikes that show our disdain for birds in the urban environment. And um, I think this kind of sense of conflicted, or the conflicted sense that humans have toward animals is exemplified or exacerbated by um, humans' perception of maintenance in the urban environment. So oftentimes when you see places that are under, considered to be under-maintained um, with overgrowth and all sorts of biological life, it's oftentimes deemed as a form of urban blight. So this kind of aids in the kind of conflicted perception that we have toward animals and um, flora and fauna in the built environment. Um, on the right, you see a um, biologist is, who's somebody I've worked with um, basically on a walk with me, pointing out actually how in, um, in this crumbling wall, you actually have a very um, kind of ha a hospitable space for, for wildlife. Um, and so I think the conflicted perception that we have toward animals is, is um, a real issue, especially when we think about um, biodiversity loss on the planet. Um, the Living Planet Index indicates that there's been a global decline by 68% from 1970 to 2016, and this is a real issue that we all need to deal with in thinking about design and thinking about the built environment. So um, this is a sort of, I guess, sort of a framework for how I've been kind of considering my work over the last 20 or so years. Um, when I first moved to Buffalo, and I was just saying to Aaron, this was 18 years ago, um, it seems, it seems, doesn't seem like it's been that long, but um, I think one of the things I started doing was, at that time, was kind of wandering around and looking at um, a lot of the kind of um, vacant structures and the kind of like open, open landscapes and kind of daydreaming about what it might be like to kind of, to kind of reimagine this environment. So I started with, um, you know, like nearly two de decades ago, doing a number of collages kind of like this, um, where uh, I was like kind of collaging in sort of 
um, a kind of expanded wall for, for animals. So this is something considering a home for, for bats and, and birds um, a, against a, um, a vacant building. And collages like this kind of reimagining a kind of expanded facade for, for a vernacular structure. Um, and at the same time, I started um, thinking about small scale projects and interventions. And so this is the first project that I did called um, Bat Tower in 2010 that was um, basically a 12-foot uh, tower that was constructed um, as a kind of conspic conspicuous sculptural object in, an, in a sculpture park that would house bats. Um, and, it, and the way that I kind of considered this project was really kind of thinking about the spatial um, conditions that bats tend to take to. Um, and as those of you who have bats in your attic might know, you know, that they get in through very small crevices and, um, you know, uh, ha ha uh, slots as thin as like half an inch to get into your, um, you know, into your structures, into your into your buildings, and they'll like they like to kind of roost between um, boards and in thin tight spaces. So taking some of these considerations, um, Bat Tower basically developed from thinking about series of uh, thin uh, slots, thin slotted spaces, kind of layered up. Um, what you see here, um, let me see if I can. If this, can, if this works, yeah. So what you see here in these grooves is basically like a, like a bat ladder. So it's a place where bats can sort of land and climb into the, into the structure. The whole project was conceived of as a kind of vertical cave. Um, so these kind of um, slotted spaces also are in the interior. Um, here's looking down the structure. And then looking up, you can see that um, the kind of uppermost part of the structure is kind of warmer, which is the part where bats would tend to, tend to roost. And, and so I was thinking about this project, not just you know, as a project for bats, but of course, considering the overall ecosystem. So also planting um, uh, vegetation at the base that, would, um, that we were hoping would attract insects that would also um, hopefully attract bats as well. Um, this was, um, you know, as a first kind of design build project, um, it was done in, in a very uh, kind of, um, in a, in, a very, in a very fun and kind of collaborative way with a number of, of students, also very scrappy um, methods as well. Um, one of the things that happened is I actually managed to like learn how to operate a rough train forklift in the whole process just to basically save on costs for the, for the, fab, or for the installation of the project. So a kind of interesting byproduct of that. And so here's the project um, after it was finished. And um, along similar lines, a project that I completed in um, 2015 for an exhibition is called um, Habitat Wall that takes on similar kind of spatial characteristics, thinking about the, the sort of slotted spaces for bats. Um, and also, uh, if, you, if you look at um, between all the structures, there's also these kind of like bird, um, bird nesting boxes there. Um, this is a kind of study model that shows, that gives you a better sense of like the kind of bat habitation spaces between the structure and also the bird nesting boxes. Um, one of the strategies for this project was also to kind of um, look at ways that we could use salvaged materials such as these um, shutters that we found from a green demolition company and also kind of planing salvaged wood and so on. Um, a interesting thing that happened in the, um, in the exhibition as, um, in, at SAIC um, it was part of an exhibition called Outside Design. One of the uh, guests was basically lying on the floor looking up into the space. So the, the image on the left shows what it might look like. Um, so it was interesting to me to kind of think about how a human might kind of try to inhabit or embody this um, project to kind of imagine as if one were a bat. And this project was basically meant to, um, initially was designed to kind of be a lining on an exterior uh, facade of a structure. And then it, and as it, as it was developed, it um, eventually became commissioned for an exhibition, so it sort of pivoted in that direction. Another early small project is called Bat Cloud. Um, this is basically um, conceived of as a kind of hanging uh, mass in the in the in in a in a place where you wouldn't necessarily expect to see it. So from afar, it appears as this kind of hanging cloud, but closer up, you can see that it's a, a bunch of vessels that are um, a bunch of individual vessels. Each of the vessels are constructed as um, bat habitat, so the kind of red outlined area is the kind of um, structure where, uh, or the area where the bats would inhabit. Um, and the idea of this is that if bats weren't to inhabit these, these, these vessels, the guano would drip down and sort of um, fertilize the, the kind of planters below. So it's conceived of as a kind of self-sustaining system. 
And um, the project was installed in a place called Tiff Nature Preserve, which is a um, former landfill in Buffalo. And so because of its condition as a landfill, we actually weren't um, allowed to even puncture the ground with, with structures. So we actually had to tie, this is the plan of the, of the project. So we had to tie the project to the trees with, um, with cables. And again, um, this was as an early project that was funded through a very small grant. It was a very scrappy process. We were making everything by hand using sewing machines and staplers and stuff in, in the studio. And um, you know, very small kind of installation crew. Um, probably the most scrappy project I've done, I think, in, uh, in, in my career so far. But, but one of the funny things that kind of resulted from this project is that after it was constructed in 2012 and it was you know, hanging, I started getting a whole bunch of um, emails from people in Buffalo and people in the communities with questions like, um, could I help them get bats out of their house? Or could I, or could I give, um, could I help the boy, their Boy Scouts or Eagle Scouts construct a bat house? Um, or even if I, there were a number of emails about whether I could sell them one of these pods. So it became really interesting to me that you know such a small project, the scrappiest one that I have done, um, was something that kind of produced this kind of resonance. And and to um, to me, I think that was really interesting in thinking about the kind of possible impacts of small projects. Um, you know, not just as kind of one-offs, but as a project that might be able to kind of combat the sort of negative um, sense that humans tend to have toward bats as, you know, rabid um, kind of vampires and so on, and which is, of course, beneficial to um, thinking about the kind of overall ecosystem of bats. As many of you probably know, they've been dying off in great numbers, uh, in, uh, starting from the East Coast, where, you know, in some places, over 90% of bats in caves have been dying to, due to a condition called white nose syndrome. Uh, which is really, you know, really problematic in a, an ecological crisis, but is something that's hardly on the public radar. And so, um, so in addition to that, I think this kind of small scale project and the kind of resonance it produced was also um, was also something that started uh, kind of um, fueling a number of interdisciplinary collaborations. So this is a biologist that I that I began working with at the time who started to kind of talk with me and work with me and thinking about how these kind of small scale projects can become almost um, like a form of science, ex uh, kind, of, kind of ad hoc science experiment, if you will. And, and um, in addition to that, um, you know, thinking about the kind of um, the resonance of these small scale projects, I became interested in, this, in the idea of architecture as a form of activism. And of course, um, at the time, you know, I was very interested in and concerned about the fact that birds were dying are dying in great numbers due to crashing into windows. As many of you um, know, the birds are not able to see clear reflective glass, so they so they fly into windows. And um, of course, there are a number of uh, kind of measures that are being taken. So at one point, there was a lead pilot credit for um, for bird glass collision deterrence. Uh, there are guidelines for bird-friendly uh, building designs. There's even, you know, glass that's being designed with uh, with um, uh, ultraviolet reflective coating, which is something that birds can see but humans um, humans can't see. But I was interested in taking on this issue of bird glass collision by thinking about it in a more visceral level. So this is a project um, developed for. Uh, for Chicago in an exhibition um, called No Crash Zone, where the idea is to basically develop a renovation of an existing window to both um, address the kind of conflicting logics of one, the, the desire for humans to kind of see out through a kind of, you know, a clear glass window and to kind of see a beautifully framed view. And on the other hand, the, um, the notion that, you know, the, or the fact that birds really need to basically see a kind of visual interference pattern to avoid crashing into windows. So this is a drawing of that, basically taking the one point perspective, looking at that. Um, and here's another view of that, of that project. Um, along similar lines, I developed a project called Bauer, and this is in, um, in um, Art Park in Western New York. Uh, this is basically uh, a series of um, kind of building-like fragments that are scattered across, um, the scra scattered across the landscape that all um, contain a series of bird nesting boxes at the top, um, as you can see here. Um, and each of the fragments also holds a, um, a glass window that is um, that uh, that contains um, drawings and paintings by by an artist who I collaborated with named Ellen Driscoll, who drew a lot of like kind of, um, uh, local birds and vegetation. But also the glass is covered with this kind of dot pattern that 
that is used to um, deter birds from flying into glass. So exemplifying or bringing this kind of condition up uh, to, to, to increase the visibility of bird glass collision. And I think the idea of activism around birds is certainly something that um, has gained more um, influence and, and more kind of um, uh, support, I think, over, over the years. Uh, even just recently in 2022, I developed a project called um, For Our Neighbors, which is this kind of amplified um, bird habitat roof structure that you see there for Brooklyn Botanical Garden. And this was part of actually a kind of large campaign um, by a music producer named Randall Poster who commissioned, who worked with Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, um, but he commissioned a number of musicians to, to, um, to, to create a, um, songs that all use like bird song as you know as source material or as inspiration, but also then commissioned a number of artists to, to design um, bird houses. So this was part of that. Um, now I'm going to kind of shift a bit to talk about um, you know collaboration. And before I talked about you know the one of the offshoots of some of these small scale works was kind of starting to collaborate with biologists who up until then were really um, I guess more like consultants on some of the projects. But at a certain point, there, I think um, the kind of collaborative opportunities that started emerging were, became quite interesting and, um, and started shaping some of the work um, that I did in more surprising ways. So one um, example of this is this project that I um, did in, in um, Australia, in Canberra, which is essentially a, um, um, a, a, a yellow box eucalyptus tree that had been taken down that we then reconstituted and made into a vertical habitat structure. But the kind of backstory of how this all happened is that I was at an academic conference um, and uh, managed to meet, you know, and this was, this was um, through uh, Australian National Univers University and managed to meet um, Darren LaRue, who's an ecologist in the yellow vest, and Mitchell Whitelaw, who is a visual um, data designer um, on, the, on the right. And in, through this conference, we sort of discovered that we all had sort of mutual interests and, and what started as a kind of discussion from an acad academic conference then turned into this kind of effort to sort of bring me to Australia, to Canberra, to, to work with them on, on this project or uh, on, not on this project, but on a project. At, the, at this time, there wasn't a tree involved. But while I was in Australia, um, um, one of the things that, that has been happening, which I wasn't aware of, is that uh, there are a lot of these like really large old trees that are actually on a list of trees to be removed from residential neighborhoods because um, I guess they, you know, the branches get so, so large that they sort of like fall and they start kind of like you know, damaging roofs and things like that. And so there's actually a list of trees that are, that are supposed to be removed. And, and to my surprise, like when I was, when I was um, during the, you know, the time that I was gonna go visit, um, uh, there was a tree that was, that was gonna be removed from this neighborhood. So rather what typically happens from what I've been told is that when they go to remove a tree, they usually basically chop it up, chop it up into a bunch of firewood or they you know, make it into mulch or something. Um, which really kind of counters the, the aspect of very large trees and that they're very good for, um, for enhancing biodiversity. And this, and this was actually the subject of um, Darren LaRue's research, PhD research, where he was really looking at the kind of ecological value of, of large old trees. And so um, part of the process of working on this project was that we developed a way for, or worked with the, uh, with the um, municipal government to basically take down this tree in as few pieces as possible, um, have it moved to a, a site called um, Bearer Hill, which looks like this. This is a kind of ecological offset zone in Australia or in Canberra, that's right next to a, um, you know, a, right next to an area that was kind of a developing urban, urbanized area, and um, kind of deforested. Um, but really, but they were trying to kind of regenerate this landscape. So you see here all these kind of saplings and, and trees that are being planted. But in the meantime, because there really are hardly, there's no vertical habitat really in this in this area, um, Darren, who at that time had, had shifted from doing his PhD research to basically working for the um, Australian Conservation um, Organization. Um, and, uh, and he was very interested in creating artificial vertical habitat structures, which is where this project came about. Um, and so we, uh, you know, after kind of taking down this tree, um, went through this process of like mapping the tree using photogrammetry to try to figure out the geometry of it. 
um, even and got it kind of to the point where we could even um, develop construction drawings of the tree and um, and and work and co coordinate with a structural engineer on on um, on on building this project. And so here's some some images of this project under construction. Here it is, um, and some images of it when it was when it was finished. And I think one of the um, interesting things about this project as well is that uh, we we attached a number of camera traps to the tree. So camera traps are basi basically motion sensing cameras, um, typically used by hunters, and biologists. Um, and these camera these cameras um, caught a um, a number of um, Im a lot of images of wildlife coming to this. So um, the data showed that from April to September of 2019, there were over 1,500 observations of birds coming to this, and there were 24 bird species observed, um, which was pretty phenomenal. There were other structures that were just kind of like phone poles that were propped up and stuff, and those, those received much less um, visitations by, by species. So we found this to be phenomenal. Um, the collaboration between myself, Darren, and Mitchell was also something that we um, we sort of you know thought about our collaboration quite a lot and even you know mapped it out um, and wrote a paper about it and I started thinking about you know um, when you know when you're all in a professional practice class in architecture school um, you I'm sure you're familiar with this the the professional practice triangle where there's a kind of uh, series of exchanges between the architect contractor and client but how can we start to think about um, the idea of collaboration. Um, differently, not necessarily as only a series of exchanges um, and a series of responsibilities, but as a, sh as a series of shared concerns and a as a kind of real collaborative effort. So I started working on these diagrams, thinking about how we were working together, um, not just as you know, architect, client, collaborator, consultant, but as, but as co-authors in this, in this whole project. Um, another collaborative project that I'll point to is um, one where I was invited by an architecture firm in, in Madrid called Eli to basically work um, as one of five, I think, yeah, one of five designers to rethink um, how to reuse spaces on the exterior of this uh, former municipal slaughterhouse um, called Matadero. So the interiors are, are renovated. There's a lot of amazing art exhibitions that are happening there, but the exterior is quite barren. And sometimes there's, you know, um, kind of temporal exhibits, but they were really interested in um, developing uh, kind of ideas for how how one might occupy the exterior plaza with vegetation and ways of preventing or mitigating urban heat island and so on. And so I worked with um, a friend of mine, a collaborator, Nerea Feliz, to develop um, this project. And so the idea of this is basically a series of urban furnishings um, that are all uh, organized in a way to kind of like, you know, support um, tree saplings, to um, to accommodate uh, pollinator gardens. We were looking at, um, you know, the kind of species of butterflies and moths and plants in, in Madrid, thinking about ways to kind of make garden spaces, um, also using colors that might start to attract um, some of the butterflies in the area, thinking about the ecosystem there, thinking about the caterpillars, which are often th oftentimes in gardens thought of as pests because they eat all of our plants. Like, is there a way to kind of create caterpillar refuges in here? Um, thinking about these walls as kind of um, insect habitats. Uh, and we were also experimenting with kind of drawing um, on the left, you see, you'll always, you'll see kind of a human vision on the right, kind of looking at insect vision. Um, we were interested in the idea of uh, positive phototaxis, which is the tendency that insects have to fly toward light at night. Um, and thinking about the kind of potential shadow that, that one might see with insects projected um, from light. So we were imagining this kind of idea of, a, of we we're calling this arthropod cinema where, um, you know, where you might have like, you know, moths flying around and you would see their shadow projected against an actual film being screened. Um, so, and looking, um, I hinted at this earlier, but looking at things like, um, like insect vision, some some of you noted in previous presentations the uh, the capacity that in insects have to to see different um, thing they, the, to see ultraviolet reflection. They don't see the way that humans do. So this was a kind of um, experimental film that we commissioned a filmmaker to do to create a, a kind of sense of butterfly vision, like what a field of flowers might look like to a butterfly. Um, 
And this is a, a kind of a project for a kind of module that showed what we were calling a human cocoon, where humans could go and kind of intimately sit inside this cocoon and, and sort of look out a wall to kind of see the world as if they were insects. Um, and here's a series of models that we produced for the exhibition. So this is all. This was all a collaborative project that was um, that was happening in, in Madrid um, in 2019. Um, at some point, um, right before the pandemic, they started. You know, they were kind of going through a starting to talk about fundraising, but of course that all stopped. So so now this project is is not happening. But still, um, I think some of the ideas of this are persisting towards some of the work that I'm that I've been doing more recently. Another sort of set of collaborations that I'll sort of point to are, um, are collaborations that I have worked on with the University of Buffalo as a faculty member as part of the Ecological Practices Research Group. Um, and I know we have, uh, there are a number of, of UB alums here, which is awesome. So really great to, really great to see you. Um, but also wanted to note, um, to shout out that the, my colleagues in the Ecological Practices Research Group are Nick Rakovich and Martha Baum, who are also alums of University of Oregon. So there's a lot of Oregon going on in, in, this, in this group. But, um, but we've been, as a group of faculty, we basically teach uh, graduate studios and, and courses that are all kind of aligned with one another, but um, sometimes we'll take on other projects as well. Um, so in 2012, one of the kind of uh, extracurricular projects that we um, initiated was um, uh, was this urban beehive in Silo City. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about this, about this project. So Silo City is a 14 acre piece of post-industrial land um, along the Buffalo River. This is what it looks like from the top. This was a view from 2012. And um, the owners of, the, of this land um, were uh, rigidized metals, which is a metal manufacturing company that, that sits neighboring this site. They were interested in renovating um, an existing building in um, on this land um, at the time, and and they basically found this. There was this beehive that had been growing in there for like I don't know over six years or something. And so the, at first they were going to get a, a beekeeper to remove this hive, um, but after um, some discussions with faculty, including myself, Martha Baum, Chris Romano, Linda Schneekloth, a number of people in our faculty, um, there was a, a move then to basically rather than having a beekeeper come and take this away to basically develop a project, a kind of a competition for students to kind of reimagine how one could rethink um, housing this, this beehive. And so after a kind of, you know, semester, half, you know, half a semester of kind of charrette and competition, um, one of the um, student projects emerged as the winner, which is a project called Elevator B. Basically, it looks like this. It's a, um, it's a stainless steel tower where there's a kind of wooden uh, elevator cab on the inside that the students call the B cab. It can get hoisted up and down with a pulley. When it goes down, which you see on the lower right, or sorry, lower left, there's a door that swings open. A beekeeper can tend to, can tend to the bees. And when the, the bees fly out of these holes and they can sort of swarm around with all these kind of openings as well. And um, it was quite a quite interesting process to get the whole hive in there. It involved a shop vac. Like, like sucking the bees out of the original, original hive and shooting them back into this box, hoping, crossing our fingers and hoping that the queen would make it in there. Um, but but it, was a, it was a really kind of really engaging and kind of fun process for the students. I think about this project a lot not in terms of not just uh, kind of, not just as a kind of teaching kind of student faculty experience, but one that really engaged many, many stakeholders. So there was, you know, rigidized metals like faculty, um, you know, administrators, uh, students, a beekeeper, a, um, you know, a landowner, and, and so on. So, so I, I've been doing a lot of diagrams just thinking about these kind of collaborations. One of the interesting things that came about um, in this project, too, was the kind of public reception of it. So when, um, when we first were building this project, or when the students were first building this project in 2012, um, there was a newspaper article that came out in the local news basically talking about how how UB students were um, designing and building a beehive. And at that time, it, the, the comments um, before anything was actually built, the comments were not the most you know, generous. So uh, things like, I don't know what to say. The waterfront ideas presented each week get increasingly worse. Next week, we'll read that some other fringe, fringe group has decided to plant a 14-acre 
14 acres of poison ivy on the waterfront and water it with recycled wastewater from the city, all paid for by a grant from the US Botanical Society, a new 14 member panel appointed by the governor to explore the best possible use of her waterfront he will never visit. So not necessarily the greatest thing for students to read as they're building something, um, but um, afterwards, thankfully, there was a lot of good press about the project, not only from you know, architecture um, kind of trade journals and, and, and professional magazines, but also from, from popular, from popular um, press, including even as late as 2019, right before the pandemic, when um, CNN Travel named Buffalo um, one, of one of seven inspired ideas for Fourth of July, July vacation, they somehow managed to show Elevator B and, as a kind of cover image for that. So we were delighted to see that. Um, one of the other um, projects, um, kind of, and this is a this is a design build project. Um, the last project is a kind of design build project that was authored and built by five graduate students in the Ecological Practices Group. This is a project that that resulted from three semesters of design build um, with three different faculties: Laura Laura Garofalo, myself, and Nick Rakovich. Um, that uh, uh, that actually happened through the pandemic as well. So this is a basically a trellis. Um, also at Silo City that was designed um, using salvaged um, um, conduit material. So all the pipe there that you see is, is, is salvaged conduit from, from uh, rigidized metals. And it's basically a 60 foot diameter trellis that, was in, that is designed to um, train willow trees to grow into a canopy. And um, it's built on a, in, an area of land in Silo City that was um, fraught with all sorts of um, knotweed that um, the, that the stu land steward was trying to kind of um, um, get rid of. And so part of the process involved not just kind of building the structure, but also putting down um, a hugel culture and all sorts of um, um, and, and other sort of um, uh, layers on the ground before before actually building this thing. So there's so there's multiple layers on the ground before this structure actually got built. But this is this was completed in 2020 and it already has like loads of you know the trees were just planted and they're they're growing in really nicely. Um, here's some, some more views of it. And even recently um, we had a, a book launch um, event and kind of book uh, kind of symposium at, at, at the trellis. So um, the idea of this project is not just to kind of like help regenerate the landscape of Silo City, but also to kind of create a gathering space for the community members to, to come um, for events and so on. And um, let's see, so the, um, the last kind of uh, um, uh, small scale design build project that I'll show or small installation that I'll show is a project that I developed for um, Exhibit Columbus as a um, university design research fellow in 2021. Um, this was a, um, oftentimes I think for these kinds of in, um, festivals and biannuals like Exhibit Columbus, I think oftentimes you see the sort of faculty member or the kind of architect as the, um, as the kind of author of the project. But what I wanna emphasize about this is that as you know, um, as a university design research fellow, it's very much a kind of, kind of um, expanded collaboration across, um, you know, across not uh, across the the um, department with many many people involved. And I have a video that will explain this a little bit later. Um, but maybe just to kind of show the project um, or to talk about the project a little bit. Um, first, the theme of Exhibit Columbus in 2021 was new middles. Um, and so in response to this, um, uh, th this theme, which was authored by the guest curators at the time, Mimi Zeiger and Iker Hill, um, I started to think about this idea of um, who the middle species are. So rather than, than flagship species, how do we think about the middle species or those who might be, um, who might be living in our neighborhoods, living in our, in our, um, in our cities, and are ones that we might not necessarily expect. And, and I think there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, thinking about um, um, animals as neighbors, thinking about them as, as relatives. And, I, and this is a kind of um, a, a way of thinking that I've been, I've been really interested in, in um, kind of trying to kind of explore a bit and through this work. And so, um, so how, do, how do animals occupy the city? So one of the things that I think was interesting to explore was just to kind of, um, to look at Columbus and to kind of, um, and this is basically um, the images that you see at the top are, are GPS uh, mappings of bats in Columbus, which I recorded by kind of walking for hours and hours around Columbus, Indiana. 
And you can see you know, that kind of against the sort of um, modernist uh, um, grid and against the kind of the, the beautiful design of, of Saarinen and Dan Kiley, um, there is a kind of another order that's emerging, which is the kind of, which is the life of the animal in this area. And so, so um, I became really interested in you know, where species were living, um, mapped a number of the kind of local species based on kind of strata, and started to kind of conceive of this project as a as um, a kind of series of layers, series of elevational strata, where at the at the top one could address or or think about the kind of housing or accommodating um, the uh, bats and birds in the area, and then below thinking about the kind of terrestrial amphibious species through a kind of um, through this kind of stone landscape. And so this was the kind of conceptual idea for the project. My site was in Mill Race Park, um, which is designed by um, Michael Van Vol Valkenburg with structures by Stanley Sadowitz. And so the idea was to basically create a series of towers that would, that would contain um, these sort of like this, this kind of elevational strata that would also start to kind of hint at um, and have a conversation with the kind of observation tower in the, um, in the area. And so here's some images of the project um, when it was completed. Um, it was located on uh, the, at the confluence of two rivers um, in, uh, in Mill Race. And so the project is, it really takes, you know, the, the stones taken to, stone landscape takes into consideration the, uh, the kind of amphibious um, kind of territory in that area, but also kind of looking at the order of the trees and how the project might kind of situate itself kind of in alignment with the, with the trees in that, in that area. Um, before I show the video, one last thing I'll point out is that while we were building the project, um, uh, you know, so this is a, a view of some of the students who um, who were working with me on this project, um, you know, building these dry stack stone mounds. Um, during the process of building it, all, these little toads started hopping into the project. Um, they just literally started kind of coming toward the project and jumping in. One of the things we realized is that our bases were too tall because the toads kept jumping up and smacking themselves on the steel. Um, <laughs> so, so in in to kind of you know while we were installing, we basically started modifying the bases to lower to to build up the the steps for the toads so that when they came up closer to the project, they could hop in more easily without. Um, you know, exerting too much per, um, effort to, to get in. And so um, with that, I'm going to kind of go through, um, so these are some images of the project. And I'm going to um, talk about one last thing before I show a video. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever heard a bat echolocation trans translated, um, but I'll, sh I'll share it here. So bats are animals that we typically can't hear with our ear because their echolocation is, that, is, that, is too high of a frequency. But through um, bat detection tools, you can understand and, and hear them and hear their patterns. And through this, you can identify them. And so I, I, a lot of this project really involved um, uh, kind of playing with bat echolocation tools, um, putting, putting um, uh, monitors in different places. And then, but also, um, uh, working with musicians to basically sample and mix this. So obviously, this, I'm not a musician. My, I, I collaborated with musicians who were doing this. So here's an example of some of this. <laughs> oh, OK. So, <laughs> so um, I'm going to show a video um, that will, um, that will, and I, I I had I was thinking about this yesterday, but because of the kind of UV students who are here, I swapped the short video in for a longer video to show the extent um, that uh, the extent of the collaboration, not just amongst, not just between myself and and uh, in the students who who were working with me, but also the kind of landscape of collaborators um, that were involved both at the university and also as part of Exhibit Columbus. I'll show this. It's about seven minutes long.
participants were students from AIAS, American Institute of Architecture Students, UB Nova, National Organization of Minority Architecture Students, and Double ASAP, African American Students for Architecture and Planning. These students worked with me back and forth between Zoom and in-person model building to develop and visualize the first design ideas. My graduate assistant, Nicole Sarmiento, played an enormous role in really developing the design of the project throughout the spring semester. Mark Bajoric, our instructional engineer and my longtime collaborator in Buffalo, was a critical part of our team as well. In tandem with the design process, I conducted a graduate studio that looked at Columbus and asked students to research the city and develop speculative proposals to amplify habitat for middle species in the region. As a compendium course, my colleague Gregory Delaney taught a seminar that explored the landscapes of Columbus through research and drawing. At the UB School of Architecture and Planning, the culture of making is emphasized in the kinds of projects that we do and also in the way that we dedicate our attention and resources. For Exhibit Columbus, I was keen to explore the culture of materials, not only in terms of their performance, but also in terms of life cycle and sourcing. So, early visits to material suppliers, such as Estes and Coke Indiana, as well as looking at the Indian hardwood industry, influenced the material ecology of the project. Fabrication, I was also very interested in highlighting the community of makers in Buffalo. Our materials and methods shop is fantastic, and it's one of the most used and beloved spaces on campus. It's not only an incredible resource for design studios, but also for seminars and even some large lecture courses, such as structures. Our shop manager, Wade Georgie, is really the secret ingredient to making design build projects happen. For our project, he not only coached us all on welding, which was pretty much new to everyone on the team, but he also fabricated critical components. And in the face of some of the supply chain issues that impacted our schedule, Wade also helped us secure a good part of the lumber that we needed to construct our project. And he even donated some decade-old salvage steel from a past design build project at the school. In addition to three members of our original team, a number of additional students and alumni pitched in to help us fabricate the project throughout the summer. The installation process in Columbus was supported and really made possible by the local community. We were amazed by the level of care and attention that Vince Rubio and his team from the Department of Public Works put into all of the installations. And we were very grateful to Tim Coomer and his team from the Mill Race Park Maintenance Group for all their help. And personally, I was forced to learn how to operate a boom lift thanks to the staff at Ogle Front. Additionally, we were energized by the enthusiasm of all the volunteers from Columbus who helped out, including the Environmental Club of Columbus North High School. But it was really our dedicated crew of three UB students Nicole Sarmento, Bethany Greenaway, and Shivan Go, who were at the heart of the installation process. I can't say enough about how hard this group has worked, not only during the hot days on site, but all throughout the summer. Additionally, we are so grateful to colleagues and friends who made an effort to join us for a little time in Columbus to lend a hand. Greg Delaney, Albert Chow, Lisa Lansberg, and John Fitton.
Oh, oops. So yeah, so all of the projects I've talked about so far are small scale interventions, um, you know, small, small structures. But I'd like to kind of like zoom out and think about the potential of these, um, not just as kind of one off projects, but ways that we can reimagine the kind of urban landscape, not just as in the case of Buffalo, a series of vacant lots, um, you know, but rather think about the potential of what a kind of aggregation of small projects can produce. And so to kind of conclude this um, presentation, I'll, I'll run through a thought experiment, um, which basically looks at the zoning, uh, kind of old zoning codes in Buffalo. Um, so this is from, we, we recently in the, around 2014 had our zoning codes like um, revised, but up until then there were, we had zoning codes that were from like the 50s, I think. I think they hadn't been changed in like over 50 years. And so I was looking at some of, these, some of these antiquated zoning codes to see like where one might be able to kind of intervene. And so if you look at the kind of zoning map of Buffalo and zoning, so those of you who work on, you know, who work on um, urban issues are familiar with this kind of thing. Um, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail in this, but really just to say that I was looking at the kind of like form and use of it and, and quickly sort of started thinking about the kind of restrictions that zoning places on, on certain uses. Um, and so in Buffalo at that time, you know, R1 or residential one is kind of more restrictive than R2 and so on, so sort of um, ballooning out from there. And one of the things I noticed is, um, you probably can't read this, but everything that's outlined in green, it basically indicates um, that uh, if there is that if you have a um, if you have a boundary condition between residential and industrial zo industrially zoned property, that there's a requirement of a hundred foot setback in the industrial property. So if you think about that, it's actually quite a lot. And a hundred feet is like half a block of Manhattan, or I guess Portland for that matter. Um, so it's a very very big distance. And um, so what happens in these kind of areas, oftentimes when you, when you have a kind of setback um, where it's seen as a restriction, it's just kind of filled with garbage. So I started looking at um, the zoning um, or at the, at the boundaries between industrial and residential, started outlining them um, here and kind of walking through. Here's just some like quick um, screen views or street views of that. And as you can see on the residential side on the right, there's a very, and the industrial on the left, there's a very big uh, set back on the left hand side. And so um, thinking about these kind of spaces outlining the the kind of boundaries between residential and industrial zones in Buffalo, I started to think, well, what would happen if we started connecting um, these uh, these zones through with, uh, you know, um, connecting them with urban um, vacant spaces and green spaces? What would happen if you started connecting them? Um, could this start to kind of begin to kind of um, could one begin to imagine a series of green infrastructures kind of moving through the city? And at the same time, I was also looking at things like um, the blue areas that are outlined are basically um, uh, restrictions that say that if you have a certain type of use that you need to have either a six foot high wall around your property or walls with no windows or windows that don't open which um, hopefully that's something that they've changed. But at that time I was like going around and looking at, you know, some of these spaces like where, you know, what would you rather have a, a kind of windowless wall that's, that is that way because of zoning or is there a way that one could imagine um, ways to kind of rethink that, um, that facade to include a kind of more um, productive, more um, hab habitable ecological, ecological situation like on the right. And so, um, so I think, I've been talking about um, design for the collective and thinking uh, and asking us all to reconsider um, who we're designing for, then thinking about how design can serve as a form of generative activism, um, bringing awareness to environmental issues um, in terms of um, um, climate justice issues as well. And thinking about designing for the collective, I think is also not just about who we're designing for, but also who we're designing with. Um, how do we think about collaboration and co-authoring as part of our practice, not just as um, collaborations with humans, but also with institutions, with in, um, industries, and of course with animals themselves, and designing um, projects at multiple scales from the kind of small intervention to thinking about kind of large scale, large scale um, planning with a sense of care. Um, how do we consider our stakeholders um, as neighbors, as relatives, as kin? Um, and I think it's through these kind of sensibilities of care that we can imagine how um, the work that we're doing as architects and designers can produce broader resonances and effects on our shared planet. So thank you.
Thank you, Joyce, for that wonderful presentation. Now we'll be taking some questions. Um, first, are there any questions in the room? Yes. I'll pass you the mic. Well, I'm a professor, so I probably don't need one. No. <laughs> so generally speaking, how successful are your projects at actually attracting bats? Um, well, so Bat Tower actually, the first few projects, so Bat Tower and Bat Cloud, because of their sort of scrappy nature, um, really only has like anecdotal um, evidence. So it's like biologists going to visit occasionally. Bat Tower does have bats in it, it's still up. So th even though those projects were built very scrappily, the Bat Tower is still standing after being constructed in 2010. It has um, bat, yeah, I know it's crazy, it's still up. Um, it's, uh, and it has bat guano it, so, so that we know that there's bats in there. We don't know if it's actually a roost or not, but it is a, it has been used by at least bats like um, kind of stopping in there. Bat cloud, um, interestingly, um, was, uh, it was constructed in 2012. There was no evidence of bat living in it until about 20, 17, there was a biology professor in, in the Buffalo area who started doing a kind of survey and found some bats living in there. So at that time, they were actually going to remove that project because it was, it was a very, um, it was actually developed for a kind of a festival that was really only meant to be up for a year or two. Um, but then it, it kind of stayed up because there was so much interest in it. And then the biology professor found some um, bats in it. So then TIFF Nature Preserve left it up. And um, um, but then, uh, so, but then it got it got uh, it got taken down by the ma a major blizzard that happened <laughs> last year. So, but amazingly, it stayed up for um, for about like ten years. <laughs> um, and then uh, to middle species with love, which is the exhibit Columbus project. Um, that one was has only been up for a year, but it's been it's being relocated to a bunch of different. Um, places. So it didn't get bats the first year, which is not a surprise um, because it wasn't built during bat roosting season, um, such as the kind of issue with some of these kind of design festivals. Um, but it, it's now been moved. Um, all the pieces have been moved to different locations. Some of them are in pollinator parks and some are in, um, are in uh, uh, on private property. There's even one at the Miller House, actually. <laughs> yeah. So. Wonderful. Any more questions from the audience? Or one from Nancy. Thank you very much, Joyce. It was really beautiful to see all these provocative projects. Very fun. Um, I was thinking about the temporal nature of these projects and the difference in scale between these provocative art and design installations and your activist role there and then the huge scale of the urban zoning, which mm -hmm. I thought was really provocative. And I guess my question is similar to what came up earlier when talking to Chris, Aaron, and maybe Yosef about this whole way of, is it a one-off only, or do you try to disseminate and make it happen in every backyard? Do you have <laughs> some thoughts about how you might work between the small installation and you know this uh, code change, which I love, by the way. The yeah. idea of codes is making it real. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. It's something I've been thinking about quite a lot because I feel that um, with the small scale works, they, they do have a kind of t provocative nature that because of their ability to also stand as, an, as public art to some extent, um, and so they're sort of accepted as such. But even, even in, um, you know, even earlier on when I started designing Bat Tower, or like th which was back in 2009, um, I was trying to, I was, I was actually looking for a site that was in Buffalo, in the city itself at the time, and there were a few um, nonprofits that were interested, but actually at that time there was, uh, the people were interested but were, but were sort of um, anxious about having a structure built that was meant to be for bats. And um, so there was a bit of hesitation just in terms of acceptance, and so that, which is one of the reasons why it got built, why I ended up citing it out in, um, in a place called um, Griffith Sculpture Park, which is about 40 minutes outside of Buffalo. And so I think, um, you know, so even, even though art kind of small projects can, you know, are kind of more, at least now, nowadays in 2023, I feel like they're more commonly accepted as, you know, things that you can put in your backyard. I'm doing a um, project now that's a kind of, uh, 
you know, that's like insect habitats and different kind of pollinator gardens and, and things. And some of that is like much more accepted now, but I think it does take some time. Um, I feel like the, you know, the next move for me is probably to do a demonstration building of some kind to kind of scale up between um, this kind of small scale installation and, and, um, and something larger. What's that? No Michael Graves T5 for Target? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not at this point. <laughs> Joyce, thanks so much. I just loved this presentation. And I'm just, I've got, it's curious to me that here in the States, there seems to be a lot more anxiety and fear over bats than mm -hmm. in other cultures, like in Sydney in the Royal Botanical Gardens, and I don't know if you remember this, but when we were walking through the Royal Botanical Gardens, there's a whole part of the Royal Botanical ba Gardens where you know that you're walking through an area that's covered in bats up the top, mm -hmm. right? And I never thought twice about it. And then we took American students and <laughs> went with my American <laughs> husband. <laughs> and we, he's like, that smell, smells like bats. I said, oh yeah, they're all up there, honey. He's like, what? <laughs> and right. I'd, I'd never really realized that it was something to be fearful of. So it, it raises the point of like, you know, you've, you've, you've brought up an interesting issue of like when it presents itself as public art, mm -hmm. then people are less anxious about it. And I'm wondering, you know, as another iteration of this with a social scientist, of how you might be able to measure or document mm -hmm. in some way changes in perception, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to create structures where we're welcoming in other species, but if we have a surrounding social context that still um, experiences that in a hostile way or raises levels of anxiety, how might the structures that we create be part of moderating that anxiety in some way? Right, right, yeah, no, that's a really, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, absolutely, I think um, uh, it is interesting the difference in perception and, and context. I found that, you know, I, I, when I was in Australia, um, working in Canberra with, with um, Mitchell and Darren, that there was so much acceptance of, you know, of, of course, this was much later. This was in 2017 when I went there, but uh, everybody was uh, super excited about, about bats and animals there, um, which was, which, you know, earlier on was very different in the, in the U.S. But I think, um, I think trying to, I, at least some, something I've been kind of also going back to Nancy's question as well is like, I think one of the things I'm trying to kind of um, think through in, in developing, you know, not just kind of public art, but thinking about, you know, walls and structures is how do we, how do we create this kind of sense of cohabitation and shared space without, without, um, uh, while also addressing this kind of idea of like transgression um, that humans are so kind of, uh, you know, anxious about. Like, how do we, how do we actually kind of like think through that? So these are, yeah, there's a lot of questions in my mind, but that. Right. Yeah, yeah, at what point? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. At what point do you feel like you're in their space? And they're in ours. <laughs> yeah. Great points. Great yeah. questions. Uh, any more questions for Joyce? Got one in the back. I'm running. Oh, you're running. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I found the uh, your anecdote of the toad a very um, interesting aspect of the project in terms of um, improvising um, mm. and like I guess to quote Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park that nature <laughs> finds a way um, <laughs> how, how do you see that uh, that need for being able to improvise your design because mm. you nature is interacting with um, or cre creatures are interacting with something in a way you couldn't foresee so when you're building something, you're thinking of longevity, you're thinking of structural rigidity, et cetera, but then mm -hmm. maybe you have to make a change. Is there, yeah, how do you see that playing a role? Yeah, that's a really, really good point. I think we have to improvise, we have to provide for, um, or kind of assume that there's going to have to be some form of improvisation regardless of 
what what it is, whether it's um, you know whether it's kind of thinking about uh, inha you know inhabitants, thinking about um, collaborators. Um, that's a kind of I would say the toad example is a salient one because it's something that was acute. Like we noticed it. I can I documented it. You know, there's um, we can tell the story of it, and there's and there's a sort of non-human charisma aspect of that too, is, which is also something I'm interested in, as well. I'm not sure if you if you're familiar with the term non-human charisma, but I'm sure you're aware of it, which is you know the the way that um, humans are you know, and this is this is a term used by conservation biologists to kind of talk about the kinds of the kinds of ways that that you can kind of convince humans to kind of like or to kind of support certain causes. You know, to use things like you know koalas and pandas to support animal, um, you know, animal conservation as opposed to say cockroaches. Um, so I think there's certainly, even though toads are are animals that we that we might not necessarily think of charismatic right away, the kind of story of it lends a kind of charismatic viewpoint to it. So that's something I, anyway, I think that's that's something that I think we can kind of talk about. But it, but it, but. Um, Improvisation happens everywhere. I would say, like, actually, the tree project in Australia was there was so much improv improvisation in that, despite how much work we did trying to figure out the geometry of it and working on structures and thinking about the loads and and all that stuff, there were so many things that happened that um, part of the reason for writing the paper with Mitchell and Darren was actually because we were just trying to think through all of the things that we didn't plan for and how we accomplished that together. Um, and anyway, so I, I think that's something that we just do all the time as architects. Any, anyway, we have to you have to plan for uncertainty, <laughs> for sure. Isn't that even more the case with like co-creation with other people? Though? Oh, yeah. Like, that that is 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 Right. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's I think that's absolutely true. Um, I wonder sometimes I think like I wonder if that's the way we should be thinking about not just designing for for uh, multi species habitats, but also thinking about how we design for humans. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you'll be in a situation where you know something is designed and the architect says it's this way and if it's if the human occupants um, are kind of responding in a different way how do we adapt so adaptability and kind of developing generosity of space and and ways of kind of improvising i think is really important yeah but for sure i think i think animals give us a really good lesson a really good way to kind of to um to think about this in an acute in an acute way or to explore these ideas in a cute way, yeah. These are all great questions. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, one last call for questions in the room. Okay, let's give Joyce another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.